Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 15. In this part, I'm going to teach you how to rotate ellipses in three-dimensional space. I've shown you how to draw ellipses with various equations, and I've shown you how to determine the position of an orbiting body at a specific time along an ellipse. This enabled me to do animations of the motions of planets. Objects orbit in three-dimensional space, and orbit eccentricities are never perfectly aligned, and orbits never move in the same plane. This part accounts for that. I'm also going to show you how to do a fairly accurate simulation of the uh, planets orbiting in the solar system. Matrices are numbers, variables, or equations that are organized in rows and columns. They're like tables. Here, here I'm showing you a matrix for A and one for B. The A and B characters are bolded, and that notation implies that A and B represent matrices. A is a two by three matrix and B is a three by two. The rows and columns are also surrounded by large brackets. I can multiply a matrix by a scalar quantity, which is just a number. If I multiply lambda times A, I simply multiply each element of the matrix by lambda. This operation is commutative, meaning that multiplying lambda times the matrix A gives the same result as multiplying the matrix A times the scalar lambda. I can multiply a matrix by a matrix. A times B is expressed this way. The product is another matrix. If A is an N by M matrix, B must be an M by P matrix. The second dimension of A is M, and the first dimension of B is M. In other words, the number of rows in A must equal the number of columns in B. Otherwise, you can't multiply the two matrices. Here's how multiplication works. Start with the first row of the first matrix, then the first column of the second matrix, that gives the value or formula for the element in the product matrix in the first row and first column. Multiply A times alpha and add that to B times beta plus C times lambda. Now take the second row in the first matrix and the first column in the second matrix. That fills in the element of the product in the first column second row. Go back to the first row in the first matrix. Now go to the second column in the second matrix. That gives the element in the first row and second column in the product. Now take the second row in the first matrix along with the second column in the second matrix. That gives the last element in the product, the element in the second row and second column. Here's the product of B times A. We can multiply B times A because B has three rows and A has three columns. Here's the product of B times A. Notice that it's not the same as the product of A times B. Matrix multiplication is not commutative. These two matrices are called column vectors. We use them to represent vectors in a coordinate system. Oh, these two matrices are column vectors. So we use these to represent vectors in a coordinate system. This is what A times B looks like, and this is what B times A looks like. Here's a matrix B. A here is a matrix, B is a column vector. A can be, can be the multiplicand and B can be the multiplier. A comes first, B comes second. That works because A has three columns and B has three rows. And here's the product. B times A doesn't work. B has one column and A has three rows. I want to review some of the equations I've taught you already. This is the equation for an ellipse in rectangular coordinates. A is the semi-major axis, B is the semi-minor axis, and the distance to the focal point is F. Eccentricity denoted by epsilon is defined to be the focus divided by the semi-major axis. And F thus equals A times epsilon. Let's say that an orbiting body is at position P. This is the position vector. The origin is at the focus of the ellipse. The angle formed by the position vector is theta. And we refer to this as the true anomaly. The periapsis point is the point on the ellipse closest to the focus. That's um, and the focus is the origin of the coordinate system. And then the length of the position vector is r. This is the equation for an ellipse in polar coordinates. If the denominator is 1 plus epsilon cosine theta, then the focus is on the right. And we'll follow that convention. I convert uh, polar coordinates into rectangular Cartesian coordinates with these equations. R cosine theta is the x component, and R sine theta is the y component. 
I can represent these two equations in the following way. The xy column vector represents the position vector. It's equal to the column vector r cosine theta and r sine theta. And since r is a scalar, I could represent the column vector this way. And I could substitute r. Um, typically, I won't do this. I prefer to use the um, simpler matrix than this more complex one, especially when I code this in Python. In two dimensions, I've already talked about the eccentricity of the ellipse and the true anomaly. Think of those as two degrees of freedom. They're fundamental aspects that affect how the orbiting body travels through space. Here, I want to introduce the third degree of freedom. I can rotate the ellipse. If the orbit were circular, rotation would be meaningless. A circle rotated is the same circle. Because an ellipse is oblong, it can be rotated. Let's call the angle of rotation phi. This is counterclockwise rotation. The position rotates along the ellipse. I'll call the rotator position P prime to distinguish it from the point P. That means that the position vector rotates too. It forms the same angle uh, theta with the major axis line. For the blue ellipse, the major axis line is co coincident with the x-axis. For the red ellipse, the major axis line is at a phi radian angle. This angle here is theta plus phi. And let's say the coordinates for P are x, y, and the coordinates for P prime is x prime, y prime. If x is r cosine theta, then x prime is r cosine theta plus phi. The same is true for y prime. It equals r sine theta plus phi. Recall the trig identities for the cosine and sine of the sum of two angles. I discussed this in a previous part. I can make those substitutions for cosine theta plus phi and sine theta plus phi. I can then multiply both terms by r in both equations. And then I'll group them in this way with r cosine theta and r th sine theta in parentheses. r cosine theta is equal to x. r sine theta is equal to y. I can make those substitutions. And let's repeat those two equations up here. This can be expressed in matrix form. The column vector with all ones on the right will recreate the two equations for x prime and y prime when you multiply the two matrices. I can factor out the x and y and put an x and y in the column vector in place of the ones vector. This equation will take coordinates x and y and will rotate them by phi. This matrix is called the rotation matrix. It's used extensively in orbital dynamics. Since I'm going to be computing the position of a planet in an orbit, I don't want an xy column vector. I can substitute r cosine theta and r sine theta for x and y. I now have an equation that represents our third degree of freedom. The simpler method, there's a simpler method that does the same thing. If I simply add phi to theta in this equation, it results in x prime and y prime. I do that if all I had to do was rotate this ellipse one time. I need to do two more rotations, however. I'm using rotation matrices in this case, so I can set this up for two additional rotations, which I'll show you next. I want to show you what this looks like in Sketchpad. First, I'm going to create a square grid to plot this on, and I'll expand it. And I want to create a parameter for a semi-major axis. I'll call that A. Then another one for eccentricity, and I'll call that epsilon. And I'll set that to 0 0.8. And here, I want to set up the function for an ellipse and polar coordinates. And that's a times 1 plus epsilon squared. Divided by one plus epsilon times the cosine of theta. Then if I plot this function, I get an ellipse. Here I'll put a point on the ellipse as the orbiting body. 
and I'll label that P. And then I want to draw a line segment to the periapsis point and to the position P. And then I'll mark this angle and label it theta. This is the true anomaly. And I'll measure that angle. And let me label this R. So if I calculate R of theta, that's the length from the origin to the position P. And now I want to set up a parameter of phi. And I'll set this to 0 0.66 radians. Now I'll create a new function for the rotated polar coordinates. And I'm going to do this the simple way. I'm not going to use a rotation matrix here just for convenience. So that's 1 minus epsilon squared. Divided by 1 plus epsilon times the cosine of theta minus phi. And I'll call that r prime. And if I plot that function, I get a rotated ellipse. So again, that was a simple way. This is not the equation that I recommend you use, but just for convenience, I'm using this to plot the rotated ellipse. Now here I'm going to calculate the x-coordinate for p. That's r times cosine theta. And I'll label this x. And then I'll calculate the y-coordinate, r times sine theta. And I'll label that y. So with Sketchpad, I can derive the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate, and you see they're all the same. All right, and I'm going to make this red to distinguish it. Now I want to calculate the rotated coordinates. So that's r of theta times the cosine of theta. I'm, that should be cosine. Times the cosine of phi minus r of theta times the sine of theta 
times the sine of phi. So that's the value of the rotated x coordinate. And I'll label that x prime. And here I'm going to calculate the rotated y coordinate, r of theta, times the cosine of theta, times the sine of phi, plus r of theta, times the sine of theta, times the cosine of phi. And I'll label this y prime. Now that was backwards, so I'll do that again. So if I plot x and y, now you can see that rotated point is on the red ellipse. And I'll label that p prime. So now as I move p around on the purple ellipse, I get a p prime on the red ellipse that has been rotated. So the equation I just showed you for x prime and y prime is the proper way to do this. Now, I want to determine the periapsis point for the red ellipse. So that's simply r of 0 times cosine of 0 plus phi. And then r of 0. times sine of 0 minus 5. Now if I plot those points, I get the periapsis point for the red ellipse. And I'll draw a line segment from the origin to that point and the origin to p prime. And now I'll measure the angle that those two line segments formed. And you can see it's the same angle as theta. So this just shows you that I've successfully rotated the coordinate p prime. So as I move p around, I get p prime on a rotated ellipse. I can change the semi-major axis and the math still works. Likewise, I can change the eccentricity and the math still works. All right, so that's how you rotate coordinates in two dimensions. Orbits happen in three dimensions. So what I've shown you so far only accounts for two. I need to add a third dimension, which I'll call the z-axis. I'll add a row to the column vector. So Kepler's first law states that planets orbit along an ellipse in a plane. So if z is 0 at all points, then any ellipse I create will be in the xy plane. And all I need to do is add a 0 in the third row of this column vector. And so this is the formula for a non-rotated ellipse. I want a formula that will do this kind of rotation in the xy plane. I showed you that before, but this time I want to rotate it in a three-dimensional coordinate system. Here's the two-dimensional formula that rotates an ellipse. If I add a row of zeros, this doesn't work. I can't multiply a 3 by 2 matrix to a 3 by 1 matrix. I have to multiply a 3 by 3 matrix to a 3 by 1 matrix. So my three-dimensional Python plot would look like this. Um, but this isn't the matrix I want to use. 
So here's how I do this. If I start with x, y, and z coordinates, and I'll set them equal to r cosine theta, r sine theta, and zero. And if this is the rotation matrix for two dimensions, then I would use this matrix where there are zeros in the last row, zeros in the last column, and a one in the far right lower corner. If I multiply x to all the first row terms and y to all the second row terms and z to all the third row terms, I get this. And then if I add them all together, I get this. The z term is zero, so the matrix simplifies to this. So here I'm going to show you Python code that will do a rotation about the z-axis. So I'm going to go back to the code that I wrote in the last part and use that as a starting point. And these semi-major axes are right, the eccentricities are right for um, the five, first five planets, but the other parameters aren't set yet. So the first rotation is about the z-axis, so I'm going to create a parameter in the init function, w. And this will be for the argument of periapsis. And I'll store it in an internal variable. And then I want to move the set coordinate function up higher. And then to do the rotations, I'm going to put the x, y, and z coordinates into an array, into a matrix. That's how you do that in Python. So now chords is the coordinate function, or the coordinates x, y, and z. And then this rotate z routine will rotate coordinates by the angle z. And if you look at the uh, return statement, that's a rotation matrix in the first argument. And the second argument is chords. And I simply take the dot product of those two matrices. And then here's how that's done. Um, self.d is wrong, I'll change that to self.w. But this rotates the coordinates um, by the angle w, and then I need to move coordinates back into um, x, y, and z variables for the plot functions. So here I want to set the periapsis point, and that's simply the first set of coordinates, because theta equals zero at the first set of coordinates. And then this is the periapsis vector that goes from zero to the periapsis point. So zero to self x, zero to self y, and zero to self z. And then here, um, I'm going to create an array of all the points that make up the reference ellipse on the graph. And then I'm going to rotate that as well. So in set coordinates, I rotated the point. Here I'm rotating uh, the ellipse that's drawn. And then I need to move uh, the coordinates back out from the array into distinct x array, y array, and z array. And then I want to be able to access w, so I created that property function. And then this function plots the periapsis vector. And I'm going to de define a notional Earth orbit. Here the eccentricity is 0 0.6, um, which is a lot more than Earth's orbit. But I want to set it up that way um, so it's more distinct. And then I'm going to do one where w equals pi divided by 3. In the first case, is pi uh, w equals 0. In the second case, is pi divided by 3. And then I need to fix the w there. And I'm going to draw the periapsis vectors um, after Earth 1 and Earth 2. So if I run this, you can see I've rotated the ellipse by pi over 3 degrees. And the periapsis vector show you the angle uh, formed by the argument of periapsis. Okay, so that's how you do a uh, rotation about the z-axis. Okay, so here's how you rotate a shape in the xy plane. To do that, I started with this matrix. Let's say I wanted to rotate an ellipse about the y-axis, which would be a rotation in the xz plane. And that would be done with this equation. And this assumes I keep the y-coordinate constant. So how about a rotation about the x-axis? This would be a rotation in the yz plane. That would be done with this equation. Notice that I use different Greek letters for each of the rotations. 
phi is about the z-axis, theta is about the y-axis, and psi is about the um, let's see, phi is about the z-axis, theta is about the y-axis, and psi is about the x-axis. And since I'm dealing with three dimensions, I'd like to transform x, y, and z into x prime, y prime, and z prime. That requires the three by three matrix. So I've already shown you one for rotation about the z-axis. Okay, let me start with the rotation about the z-axis. Here's a two-dimensional rotation matrix for rotation about the y-axis. And here I'm adding a y-coordinate. So I want, it, I want y to end up being equal to y prime. I'm only going to change the x and z coordinates. So I do that with this matrix. It has zeros in the second row and second column with a one in the middle. If you do the matrix multiplication, it ends up equaling this. And that, if you do the additions, um, you get x cosine theta minus z sine theta, then y, then x sine theta plus z cosine theta. Okay, so here is a two-dimensional rotation for rotation about the x-axis. And here I'm adding an x-coordinate. So I want x to end up being equal to x prime. I'm only going to change the y and z coordinates in this case. And I do that with this matrix that has zeros in the first column and the first row with a one in the upper left. And if you do the matrix multiplication, you end up with this. And if I add those together, I get x, which just passes through y cosine psi minus z sine psi, y sine psi plus z cosine psi. So I now have three equations for rotations. This rotates coordinates about the z-axis. This rotates coordinates about the y-axis. And this rotates coordinates about the x-axis. So this is a z-rotation matrix, a y-rotation matrix, and this is an x-rotation matrix. So I'm going to want to do three rotations. So let us let me start with a rotation in the xy-plane about the z-axis. And I'll call that x sub z, y sub z, and z sub z. Then I want to rotate those coordinates um, in the y-axis. So I'll call those transform coordinates x sub z, y, y sub z, y, and z sub z, y. And that'll make a rotation like this. And then I want to do a rotation about the x-axis. So now the zy coordinates end up being x sub zyx, y sub zyx, and z sub zyx. And that looks like a rotation on the graphic on the right. And with these three rotation matrices, I can orient um, the ellipse in any orientation in three-dimensional space. So let me do this in one equation. Let me start with the third equation, and then I'll substitute the second equation for the zy coordinates, and then I'll substitute the first equation for the z coordinates. I prefer to do rotations with separate matrices. So it's pretty clear that this is an A sub x, or an x rotation matrix multiplied by a y rotation matrix, and then a z rotation matrix. But let me show you what these would look like combined. So here I multiplied, here I'm multiplying a sub x and a sub y. And if you multiply those two matrices, you end up with the matrix on the right. And so if I take that product matrix and then multiply that by a sub z, I would get this. And if you um, use some trig identities, you can further simplify it to this. The problem with, I have with this matrix on the bottom is it doesn't save that much. I don't have any intuition about what it does. I actually prefer the one on the top. And in the Python code I'm going to write, there really isn't any compute advantage to combining these. So I prefer the one at the top. And in fact, in orbital dynamics, we don't rotate in x, then y, then z. Um, we rotate in z, and then y, and then z. Um, so given the rotations are different, this, this um, formula wouldn't even work for us. So I don't recommend you use it. So now I want to show you the 
six degrees of freedom for an orbit and the sequence of rotations. I did this with um, SketchUp, which used to be a Google product and is free on the web. It's kind of a, a simplified CAD design tool. So an orbit starts with a, um, an ellipse of a certain semi-major axis. And here I've drawn a circle. So I've chosen a size for the orbit. And after I've done that, and you can see this is in three-dimensional space. I can give the orbit some eccentricity. So here I change the semi-major axis, but assume that that stayed constant. So now I've got an orbit with a semi-major axis and an eccentricity, two degrees of freedom that define the shape of the orbit. And now I can rotate the orbit in the xy plane about the z-axis. And in orbital dynamics, we do this first. This is the first rotation. And in the order I'm going here is the third degree of freedom. We can also rotate about um, x, y, and z, but we don't do that. We don't do it that way in orbital dynamics. All right, so here's the first rotation along the xy plane, and once we've set that, the next rotation is about y. So the first shifts what we call the argument of periapsis, moves the periapsis point. This second rotation creates an inclination of the orbit. And now you can see the orbit is inclined with respect to the xy plane. So after we've done those two rotations, we actually do a rotation in along the z-axis again. And if I draw this line, we call these nodal lines. And the points along the x-axis that intersect with the ellipse are nodes. And I can use those nodal lines as a reference. So now when I do this next rotation, I'm kind of twisting the orbit in three-dimensional space. And that nodal line tells me how many degrees I've rotated from the x-axis. So it's about the z-axis, then about the y-axis, then about the z-axis. And those three rotations can orient an ellipse in any orientation in three-dimensional space. Here are the orbital elements. This is a diagram from Wikipedia. The semi-major axis is the size of the ellipse, and that parameter is not shown here. Likewise, the eccentricity is the shape of the ellipse, and it's also not shown here. The first rotation is through the angle defined by the argument of periapsis. The next rotation is um, inclination, which tilts the ellipse um, along the plane of the ecliptic, which is for the sun. If you have something orbiting the Earth, it's in relation to the Earth's equatorial plane. And then the last rotation is the twist that I talked about earlier. Um, which shifts the right ascension of the ascending node or the longitude of the ascending node. And I'll explain those terms in detail later. The last degree of freedom is the true anomaly. It's the starting position of the orbit for a given time. And then take note of this reference direction with the RAM signal. This points to the first point of areas that I talked about in part five. And I'll talk about that again later. So I want to work this up step by step. So this all starts with the equation for an ellipse and polar coordinates. And here is the conversion from polar coordinates to rectangular coordinates. And um, I'm going to leave R as a separate equation. So first, uh, when defining an orbit, we'll define the semi-major axis. Um, that a term in the polar that's the a term in the polar coordinate equation for an ellipse. 
In this case, this is a circle, so the eccentricity epsilon is zero. If I were to plug zero into the equation for r of theta, I get this. One minus zero squared is one, and one plus zero times cosine theta is one. And this equation quickly reduces to this, r of theta equals a. And so for a circle, r of theta is just simply the radius, and it's constant for the entire circle. Now set the eccentricity epsilon. Remember that r of theta is a function of semi-major axis eccentricity and, of course, theta. And the first two, the semi-major axis and eccentricity, are constants uh, for an orbit. Theta changes throughout the orbit. Now I'll get into rotations. The red ellipse is rotated about the z-axis in the xy plane, and the blue is what I started with. The line running through the blue ellipse is coincident with the x-axis. And I'll measure the rotation with this angle here, and this is called the argument of periapsis. The periapsis point is the point where theta equals zero on the ellipse. The periapsis line goes from the focus, which is the origin in the coordinate system, to this uh, periapsis point. This is the periapsis point for the blue non-rotated ellipse. The z rotation is done with the z rotation matrix. Rotated coordinates would be derived this way. This rotates x, y, and z by the angle little omega. The little w in all the trig functions in that matrix is little omega. The periapsis point for the red matrix is derived this way. This rotates the coordinates a sub p, y sub p, and z sub p by little omega, the argument of periapsis. The next rotation is inclination. Before I do that, I want to draw what's called a nodal line. Um, the next rotation is about the y-axis. It rotates along this nodal line, um, and the nodal line is coincident with the y-axis. And this will be a rotation in the xz plane. So here you can see a nodal line on the blue ellipse. Now I've extended it to the red ellipse. These nodal lines, like I said, are coincident with the y-axis, at least for now. When I do the final rotation, uh, it won't be. The nodal line being a straight line forms an angle of pi radians um, from the origin. That just means it's 180 degrees, a straight line. So if you start from the periapsis point, um, the nodes on, on the blue ellipse, the nodes are 1 half pi to the left to the periapsis point and 1 half pi to the right or three halves pi to the left. I need, however, to determine the nodal points on the red ellipse that's been rotated. One half pi would be here, three halves pi would be here, but the nodes are here and here. So this is one half pi minus omega, and this is three halves pi minus omega. And here's the formula for the first node. Now, I'll do the rotation for inclination. This is a rotation about the y-axis. So here is the y-rotation matrix. The term used for inclination is the letter i. So here's what the rotation equation now looks like. Now you can see there's two rotation matrices in this formula. Little omega is along the z-axis, and y, i is along the y-axis. The purple ellipse in this picture on the right has been rotated about the y-axis. It's now inclined. And notice that the nodal line didn't change, and that's because we rotated about the nodal line. Um, the step here where I'm using the um, y-rotation matrix for the nodal line isn't necessary, so um, in adjusting the nodal line, I'll skip that step. So the last thing I want to do is rotate about the z-axis again. And remember, orbital dynamics rotations are z, y, z. So this rotates the entire ellipse along with the nodal line. In fact, I set up that nodal line so I can measure this rotation. Um, and I showed you that in Sketchpad in the animation I did before. So here is the z-rotation matrix again that rotates this time, is, the ellipse is not rotating in the xy plane. It's just rotating about z. And I'll change phi here to the letter large omega. And um, 
Oh, that's the um, reference direction about which we measure the um, this rotation. And now I've introduced the um, last Z rotation matrix with the letter big omega. So I have little omega and big omega in this formula. And then here is what that rotation looks like. The reference point is here. And notice that the nodal lines for the red ellipse have rotated to the right. So that's the final rotation. So the nodes for the purple ellipse were determined with this formula uh, prior to the last rotation. The nodes of the red ellipse are then determined with this formula, where I just take a Y rotation matrix with omega, and I rotate X1, Y1, and Z1. The periapsis point was determined with this equation before any rotation, and that point needs to go through all the rotations, um, about Z, about Y, and then about Z. And so note that I didn't substitute R sub 0 times cosine 0 and then R sub 0 times sine 0, et cetera. When I implement this in Python, the R function is going to get back rotated coordinates. So in this equation for the um, periapsis point, I want to rotate X sub P, Y sub P, and Z sub P to get X prime P, Y prime P, and Z prime P. So the rotations are now complete. Here is the first rotation. The argument of periapsis is signified by little omega. Here is the second rotation where um, the ellipse is inclined. And then here's the third rotation signified by big omega, um, which twists the orbit, um, rotates about the nodal lines. And this is called the right ascension of the ascending node or the latitude of the ascending node. OK, so you recall in part five, I talked about the first point of Aries. This animation is set up at the vernal equinox, approximately 22 March. The vector that points from the sun to the Earth points to the first point of Aries. As the Earth orbits, it moves away from this point. The sun to Earth vector points to the first point of Aries at the exact time of the vernal equinox. In this part of the animation, I'm going to show you the celestial sphere. And now notice how the sun moves in and out of the Earth's equatorial plane. So the sun isn't really moving relative to the Earth. It's just from this perspective. So the vernal equinox point is one point during the year when the sun is aligned with the Earth's equatorial plane. And that's why it was picked. First point of Aries is this point here in the celestial sphere. It is the zero, zero point. Here's the Earth equatorial plane. And notice how the sun moves up, which is what I showed you in the previous animation. And here's the um, plane of the ecliptic. And notice here that the sun doesn't move with, res with respect to this plane. This is the plane in which the Earth or orbits the sun. So when you're on, in this perspective looking at the sun, the sun stays in this plane. And that is the plane of reference for orbiting planets. And then here are both planes. The Earth is tilted 23.5 degrees relative to the plane of the ecliptic. And notice how the intersection of the two planes form a line. That line points to the first point of Aries. And I can explain simply here. So here's a simpler depiction of the plane of the ecliptic. The central body is the sun. Here's the Earth at a 23.5 degree um, tilt with respect to the plane of the ecliptic. And then here's another view. So note the line of intersection between the Earth's equatorial plane and the plane of the ecliptic. This orientation would be at a solstice. And um, during the vernal equinox, the line from the Earth to the Sun points to the first point of Aries in the constellation Pisces. Here's another graphic that shows that. And notice that the line of intersection between the Earth equatorial plane and the plane of the ecliptic is also about that vernal equinox line.
And then here's the Earth in two places, and you can see that the uh, intersection is parallel or is um, is parallel to the, the vernal equinox line. So I'm showing you all this geometry so you can understand um, why this first point of Aries was picked. So this is where the first point of Aries is in the um, celestial sphere. It's called the first point of Aries, but it's actually at the constellation Pisces. And you recall from section five that the vernal equinox point used to point to Aries. The equinox is precess. So over time, the vernal equinox point is migrated to Pisces and it's moving to Aquarius. Hence the lyric from um, the song by the fifth dimension, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Here is a celestial sphere grid and you can see the sun moving through the zero zero point once I start the animation right there. So right at that instant is the vernal equinox. And that's our point of reference. That zero zero point is the first point of Aries. So here I'm showing an orbit that has an inclination. And I did this with satellite toolkit. I'm going to show you how to set this up at a later part. But I'm going to put the satellite in orbit. Now notice it's descending through the plane of the ecliptic and it's ascending. Descending, ascending. So remember that right ascension is the direction, uh, is the angle from the vernal equinox point. And we have two nodes. We have an ascending node and a descending node. So the reference point we use for um, rotating orbits is the right ascension of the ascending node. And so that's what's meant by the ascending node. And here you can actually see the line of nodes of the orbit. And you can see that in this orbit, it's rotated with respect to the Earth vernal equinox vector. And so that would be the right ascension of the ascending node, the angle between the Earth vernal equinox vector and the satellite line of nodes. You can also see the periapsis vector is rotated within, with respect to the um, line of nodes. Okay, so here are all those orbital elements um, that I took you through step by step. And now I want to show you how to do a simulation using Python. Okay, I want to go back to the Python code where I did a rotation about the z-axis and I want to add the other axes. And I'll rotate z, then y, then z. So again, this is what I did before. It was rotating by the argument of periapsis. And now I need two more angles, I for inclination and O for right ascension of the ascending node. I'll store those in internal variables. And then I want to create a line of nodes. Um, and I do that this way. I, I uh, compute the R function for pi over two divided by the argument of periapsis. And then the other point is, um, based on the R function of three pi over two divided by the R periapsis. And then I compute the X, Y, and Z components of each of those. All right, so those are the two points. And then with matplotlib, if I draw a line between the two points, I get a nodal line. And then I need to rotate Y routine. And so this rotates chords, the, or, the argument chords um, with that rotation vector that I just highlighted um, by y degrees, and it's done with the dot product of the chords matrix and the rotation matrix. And so here I'm going to set the nodes. And then, like I said before, I just need to rotate the nodes in the last rotation um, about the z-axis. And then I also need to rotate the reference ellipse about Y and then about Z. And then here are the coordinates I need to do likewise. I do a Z rotation, then a Y rotation, and then a Z rotation. And it's argument of periapsis inclination and right ascension of the ascending node. And then here, um, I'm going to 
create an array of all the nodal points. And this is how I plot the nodes. So this will plot a line between the two nodal points. So in this case with Earth 1 and Earth 2, I'm going to show the periapsis vector and the nodal lines. And there you can see nodal lines, which looks a lot like what I showed you on a previous slide. And this line is coincident with the x-axis. You can see x equals 0 in the plot. And now I want to create an inclination. So I'll do Earth 2 and Earth 3. And now you can see pretty clearly that the inclined ellipse was rotated about the nodal line, which is also um, coincident with the x-axis. And the animated points are following each of their respective ellipses. And now I'll create an Earth 4, which creates a rotation um, right ascension of the ascending node or longitude of the ascending node. And now you can see the nodal lines, there's an angle between them. They're both in the xy plane, but the angle between them is the longitude of the ascending node or the right ascension of the ascending node. And notice too that the points are following their respective ellipses. And then it gets a little messy with periapsis vectors and nodal lines. So here I just show the nodal lines. You can very clearly see that there's an angle between them. And that's how you measure that rotation. With everything I've shown you, I can now do an orbital simulation of the solar system. I got these parameters from a website that Paul Schichter put together. They're very good. Orbital simulations with ellipses are very limited. Orbiting bo bodies don't strictly follow elliptical paths, but they're good approximation. With Paul's parameters, which he obviously put a lot of work into, they're pretty good. And by the way, I don't know Paul. This table defines the orbital parameters for all the planets through Neptune. The orbit of Pluto doesn't conform well to an ellipse. Paul proposed another method for determining its orbit. Okay, first off, um, let me show you what each of these planetary orbits look like. Um, so for reference, here's the circular orbit. And there's actually a center point, a focus point, um, but they're coincident in this case, so you can't see them. And then if I exaggerate the orbit, um, this eccentricity is 0 0.8. And now you can see a green focus and um, a red center point. Uh, the green would be the sun if this were a body orbiting the sun. Here's a depiction of the orbit of Mercury. The eccentricity is 0 0.206. That's pretty eccentric. And I introduced these terms to you previously, but the uh, point of the orbit of Mercury that's closest to the sun is called perihelion. The point that's farthest away is aphelion. Um, the sun was named after Helios, and the element helium was named after the sun, even though there's a lot more hydrogen in the sun. So that was a bit of a misnomer, but it stuck for the um, element helium. Here's the orbit of Venus. It's almost circular. Its eccentricity is 0 0.007. And here is the Earth. It also is um, very close to circular, um, although you can just barely see the green focus point um, nudging out uh, from underneath the red center point. And you recall that Hipparchus accounted for the variation in the length of the seasons by putting the Earth in a circular orbit but off-center. Um, Kepler switched that so that the Earth orbited the Sun along an elliptical path, although slightly elliptical. Um, and being elliptical, the uh, focus would be offset from the center. All right, so here's the orbit of Mars. Its eccentricity is 0.093. Um, and you can see now there's a pretty uh, distinct focus. And you'll recall Kepler discovered that planets orbit along ellipses by using Mars as a reference. So it doesn't look very elliptical, but it was elliptical enough that um, Tycho Brahe could detect discrepancies and Kepler could explain that with ellipses.
Uh, here's Jupiter. Um, it's just interesting, it's 0 0.048. And then here is Saturn, 0 0.054. Here is Uranus, 0 0.047. And then Neptune is 0 0.009, almost circular. And then Halley's Comet um, is an extreme case. The eccentricity is 0 0.967, so highly elliptical. In fact, um, the orbit of Halley, uh, when it um, comes through the solar system, is within uh, several of the planetary orbits. Okay, um, let's look at Mercury again uh, with nodal lines. You can see the uh, shift in the argument of periapsis. And then here's the inclination. It's, um, it's about seven degrees of inclination. So Mercury has a pretty inclined orbit. And then here's Venus um, with its shift in uh, argument of periapsis. And then you can see its inclination. And then here is the Earth um, with its semi-major axis and its shift in argument of periapsis. And uh, Here are how all the orbits compare. And again, Earth doesn't have any inclination since it defines the plane of the ecliptic. So you can see um, pretty readily that Mercury is a pretty elliptical orbit compared to Venus and Earth. Okay, here I'm adding Mars. It, as I said, also has an eccentric orbit. Um, and you can see it doesn't look as circular as the Earth. And then here uh, is the inclination of Mars. It's slightly inclined. And so what you should take away here is that the planets don't orbit in the plane of the ecliptic. They all vary. And here I'm adding Jupiter. Um, as I told you before, it doesn't fit because it's so far away. So I need to adjust the scale. And I do that here. And then this is Saturn, and in this case, I am showing you the um, shift in the argument of periapsis. And it's got two and a half degrees of inclination, so it's a fairly sizable inclination. And then here's Uranus. Um, and then here is Neptune. And then this is what Pluto looks like. So it's no longer a planet. Um, but you can see the shift in the argument of periapsis. You can see how elliptical it is. And look at how inclined it is relative to the uh, planets. That's quite a bit of inclination. And then um, the orbit's fairly elliptical. And there are periods of Pluto's orbit where it is the eighth in order. Um, it comes within the orbit of Neptune. Um, and then the rest of its um, orbital period, it's uh, the ninth in order. And then this is what Halley's Comet looks like. And as I said, um, it when it's closest to the sun, it orbits, I think that's within Venus. So it comes pretty close. And it has 162 degree inclination, so it's extremely inclined. And then here's the um, shift in argument of periapsis for Halley's Comet. Yeah, and here I'm showing you, it does um, come within the orbit of Venus. Here are the orbital parameters again that I showed you previously. I'm going to use these orbital parameters in Python code to do a pretty good simulation of the solar system. Um, one thing to note, the inclination of the Earth is zero. That's because the orbit of the Earth defines the plane of the ecliptic, or pretty closely. And if inclination is zero, then there is no longitude of the ascending node. Um, remember, we do a ZYZ rotation. If we don't do the Y rotation, um, 
eigenrepairhelion rotation z and inclination would be redundant. So if inclination is zero, then we uh, by default set longitude of the ascending node to zero. So now I want to go back to the Python code and I want to create a more realistic solar system simulation. So you recall I can do a, a ZYZ rotation and this is the very last Z rotation. I can draw lines of periapsis and nodal lines. And one thing I want to do to be consistent with the parameters I showed you is change O to N for the right ascension of the ascending node. And then um, I'll change it here as well. And then to simulate planets, all I need to do now is um, create Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars with the proper parameters from the table I showed you on the previous slide. And Haley's comment wasn't in the table, but I'll show you that because of how inclined that orbit is. So now if I run this, I get a pretty good simulation of the orbits. And notice Haley's comment is going in the other direction. That's because of the shift in the argument of periapsis. So we're getting closer. Um, these orbits have the correct argument of periapsis. If you can see there's some inclination in the orbits. But one thing I haven't done yet is to set the true anomaly, which I'll do that next. Paul also provided mean anomaly for the planets. This is the mean anomaly at an epoch time of 1 January in the year 2000. Paul provided the number of degrees that uh, each planet moves in a day, but I've already computed that in Python. So I'm going to use this last column to determine the locations of planets in their orbits at um, the epoch, and then subsequently I'll uh, advance that to determine the locations at the time when I made this video. Okay, now I'm going to introduce um, the true anomaly function. And that'll be M. So this will be an input and it sets the starting point. And all I simply need to do is set M to mean anomaly. And then I need to add the M parameter based on the table I showed you on the previous slide for each of the planets. And we're not gonna simulate Halley's Comet anymore, but I'll add Jupiter. Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then I'll animate those as well. And I'm going to turn off animation. If I run this now, these are the positions of the planets at the epoch, um, 1 January, year 2000. Then if I um, increase the size of the axes, I can actually show you all the planets. So that's the position about 20 years ago from the making of this video. And then if I run this as an animation, this starts at that epoch. So these are better positions, more realistic, but it's starting from 20 years ago. So I'm gonna fix that as well. Okay, what I really want to do is to start the simulation from today. <laughs> 
So to do that, I need to import the date time library. And then this is the number of days since that epoch time, 1 January 2000. And I take today and I subtract that epoch. And now the mean anomaly is m plus the day since epoch times the orbit advance function. And then I do mod 2 pi, um, so the number doesn't get large. And then this simulation starts at the position of the planets today. And if I turn off the animation, now when I made this video, this is where the planets were. So a fairly accurate rendering of where the planets are today. Paul also provided daily correction factors for most of the orbital elements. All of the orbital parameters change over time. Ellip the ellipses are not static. In the later part, I'll talk about these perturbations. These corrections are not 100% accurate, but they are pretty good as approximations. So what I'm going to do in Python is advance all the parameters to today um, when I made this video. And then as I run the simulation, I'm going to keep adding these because the simulation runs day by day. Okay, now I want to um, make a slight adjustment. Uh, Paul's tables were in astronomical units, and so I'm going to convert the uh, semi-major axis in meters to astronomical units. And one, the distance from the Earth to the Sun is one astronomical unit, and so I'll make all those changes here. And then I need to change the self underscore a function to this. If I multiply astronomical units times that number, I get meters. And you can see that the simulation looks the same it did before. Next, I want to improve the simulation by adding adjustments to each of the parameters. So you notice in the init function, there's an A bump, E bump, W bump, I bump, and N bump. Those are daily adjustments from the table I showed you earlier. And so this is how we adjust the um, astronomical units. Uh, it gets bumped. This is how you bump eccentricity, and it's an E bump per day. Um, and then I want to store these in local variables because I'm going to bump these as we do the uh, simulation because the simulation steps once per day. Here I bump um, argument of periapsis, inclination, longitude to the ascending node, and then I store those as hidden variables or private variables. And then in this advanced orbit function, I'm going to uh, bump the semi-major axis, the eccentricity, argument of periapsis, inclination, and um, longitude of the ascending node, and I'm going to increase the number of days. And notice I'm not increasing days on the internal function. It's I'm going to use, um, oh, all right, I'll tell you that in a minute. So every time I adjust uh, semi-major axis, I need to readjust semi-minor axis focus, which I don't use, but they're there for reference. And then I need to readjust the period. If the semi-major axis changes, the period changes. And if I change the period, I need to change the orbit advance factor. And likewise, if I change the eccentricity, all those parameters need to be updated as well. So now when I change one or the other, it'll readjust. And then I want to set coordinates this way with a setter function for r. Um, so given an r, I'll compute the x, y, and z coordinates. And then I'll rotate them as I did before. And then I'll take the uh, rotated coordinate array and save that back to x, y, and z. And then I, with those coordinates, I reset the point in 3D coordinates and reset the position vector from 0 to x, 0 to y, and 0 to z. And then here's the day function I use to set the days. Um, that's the get function. Here's the setter. And if I set days, I want to make it modulus, the period, and make it an integer. 
so days is a whole number of days and it resets at the um, argument of periapsis. All right, so then when I compute the mean anomaly, the number of days is the period times the mean anomaly divided by 2 pi. And then here, instead of set coordinates, I'm going to use the R function to set coordinates. And then I, all I need to do now is set all these bump factors for each of the planets in these calls. And now I've readjusted the um, parameters, and this becomes a pretty good simulation. So this started with today, and then with every day, um, all those factors got bumped. Now, I closed the, um, the animation, and you can see I've got access to all these variables that had get functions. So, and I can set the mean anomaly. There's a setter function for mean anomaly. And if I do that, it changes the days. So if I input a mean anomaly, I can use that as kind of a calculator to determine the number of days. Okay, so a pretty accurate simulation um, of all the planets except the non-planet Pluto. One last thing I want to do is create um, properties and methods for the other forms of uh, formulas I created when I showed you Kepler's formula. So I've got a formula where you can, or property, we can set the mean anomaly. I also want to give you the ability to set the eccentric anomaly. So this just stores the eccentric anomaly off in a private variable, but then it uses Kepler's equation to compute the mean anomaly. And given a mean anomaly, we can set the number of days. And then given a mean anomaly, we can we can use the eccentric anomaly to set the true anomaly with that theta of e function. And then this would reset the coordinates um, and set r. Likewise, there's a true anomaly setter, so I want to save theta off as true anomaly. But if I set the, the true anomaly, I use this formula to compute the eccentric anomaly, e. And then some of the vagaries of the tangent functions if he's less than zero, I want to make it between zero and two pi. And then I'll store off E in the private variable centric anomaly. And then based on that, I'll use this formula to set the mean anomaly. And then if I'm saying the mean anomaly, I'll recompute the number of days that um, represents the point in the orbit. And then I'll reset the coordinates again. So now if I run this, I can run the simulation, but if I close the uh, figure window, I can access all those properties. So there's Earth true anomaly, and given that true anomaly, this is the number of days in the orbit. This is the corresponding mean anomaly, the corresponding eccentric anomaly. And now if I set the true anomaly, so given a position of the Earth in its orbit of pi divided by three, the number of days, I'm sorry, that's the eccentric anomaly. That's the mean anomaly. And this will give you the number of days. So um, Python offers some conveniences. You can run automated code, but you can also use the interpreter to compute these functions. The main takeaways from this part are the fundamental rotations uh, for an orbit, um, argument of periapsis inclination, and then right ascension of the ascending node, a longitude of the ascending node, and that's a ZYZ rotation. And then the next takeaway um, was all the Python simulations that I did. Um, and then the very last thing is uh, I want you to have some familiarity with the six degrees of freedom. So the three rotations plus uh, 
um, eccentricity plus semi-major axis, and then finally, true anomaly.